So that's why we've got districts both here in Maine, across the nation, and around the world exploring some different ways to look at the architecture of this system. Not change the standards, not you know, stop teaching, not you know, getting rid of assessments, doing all the same thing. Just looking at the basic design principles of the system. So where we're going with this is education 4.0. Okay, this is a proficiency basis. Now you're probably looking at that and going, what on earth is he showing us here? And what I'm trying to find, I'm trying to think about how do I show you a graphical representation of this? And because um, I know from good PowerPoint, I don't put a lot of text in PowerPoint, so I know I didn't want to put a big long list of stuff here. And let me explain to you what this is. How many of you are familiar with Khan Academy? All right, wow. Khan would be very proud of this. Khan Academy is a set of um, YouTube videos, for lack of a better term, a massive set of YouTube videos uh, from this young guy who was, I want to say, an MIT grad, really brilliant young guy, um, who started doing these YouTube videos to start teaching his cousins. He has all these cousins, and he's tutoring them. Um, but they lived a distance away, and he would do it by phone, but it was hard to match up schedules, and kids are, you know how kids are, they're busy doing things, and it was tough. So he just started to do a couple of YouTube videos. So he would do these YouTube videos, like 10 minutes, and he would explain a math concept or something. Um, and he would just post them on YouTube for everybody to see. And the cousins could go, they could look at them whenever they wanted to. They could rewind them and look at them again if they didn't understand it. Uh, and so he called up the cousins and said, well, because the cousins were scattered around the country, he said, well, what do you think? And they reported back to him uh, that they much preferred him on YouTube than in person. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then they could back up and they could read it again and they could look at it when they wanted to and they could look at it again if they forgot when to get ready for the test and they did a much more flexible system and worked within their schedules and they thought it was terrific and encouraged him to keep going. So he did. And now if you go on the Khan Academy website, there's thousands of videos and these videos are short. They're 10 or 15 minutes most of them. Cover a wide variety of courses. And uh, over, before very long, uh, Sal Khan, is this guy's name, got attention from some people with very deep pockets, like Google, for instance, and, and Gates Foundation. Uh, and he tells, I heard him present out in uh, California a couple of years ago, and he, talk, he tells this great story about how Google called him up and said, well, want to talk to him, and he talked about how it was going, and they said, well, what could you do with a couple million dollars? Uh, and he said, you mean personally, or? <laughs> and he said, no, to help, you know, facilitate this. And he said, well, one of the pieces we need to have is some kind of data system track how kids, what, what kids are looking at, and because we don't really have a lot of feedback, it's just a YouTube thing. And we're also getting feedback that teachers want to be able to use it, and classrooms want to be able to use it. So now they've constructed this whole system where they can track which kids have watched the video. So you as a teacher can assign your kids uh, to watch a series of the videos as a way to pick up some of these content pieces. And actually we've got schools uh, and districts, both here and I've seen presentations from other states, where we've kind of flipped the classroom which is to say that the content delivery is now done at home using YouTube and other pieces. And the homework that all of us have wrestled helping our kids with is done in school. So instead of doing the content in class and then sending the kids home who may marginally understand what you talked about and having them do the homework, you, they come in the next day, you take the homework, you stick it in your bag, and you keep going to the next day's lesson. The weekend rolls around, you finally grade the homework and you realize the kids didn't understand it. It's now four days later. Instead, what you do is the content delivery through something like YouTube or another, you know, an online class or something like that. And you can do the coursework and the helping kids in class. It's an interesting kind of model. And so what they did is they started tracking how these kids use these videos. And the videos operate in a progression. Okay, they're not random. They take this one and then the next concept, next concept. So mathematics, it builds on itself. So what this is is a map of how different kids looked at different pieces of these videos. And you'll see the kids all started sort of down here, okay? And this is days that they <coughs> did different courses, and these are the modules that they completed, going up this axis here, okay? And this is the amount of time it took them to complete those modules, all right? So what you see here is, I think, is an amazing example of what we're talking about with a proficiency-based model, which is that you'll see some kids this orange kid, for instance, whatever those early on concepts were, bang through those in a hurry. Took very little time to get through a number of modules and get all the way up here. Others of these kids wrestled with some of those early concepts. And so it took them a little longer to get through some of those, these modules down here. And most of the kids actually were down in this area, taking some time, especially if there wasn't like one module, they really had a hard time. 
that they went through here. But other kids, some of them got it a little later. This one got it early, this one got it a little later, maybe a couple days later, picked it up. They moved ahead. Some of the kids, this kid took a little longer, but then had an explosion after that. This other student did as well. Uh, and it shows that over time, the kids are moving through these progressions as they go, but at their own pace. And that's kind of what this model is. It's about disconnecting the education, the learning experience from the clock and the calendar. Because that's the system that we have. The system we have is determined by the clock. You, you're in algebra until the bell rings. Uh, and you take algebra until you run out of school dates or until you, you don't have another day to do it. And this system is much more designed to be more flexible and to, and to allow kids to move at their own pace. And so this just shows over a few days what these different modules were. And what we're seeing is districts move to this kind of a model. They use this data to track where kids go and at what speed and to what degree they get where they're going. Okay? And so that's kind of the model. And you see over time the kids reach the different modules at different times. And there may be, this also gives information to teachers to say, I need to address you know, these three kids down here because they continue to wrestle, so we need to put some type of piece into place to help them out. It's giving teachers data, this data system that they built with, the, with help from Google, is giving them some information for them. And so that's the idea. And then you can customize the educational opportunities that you have based on what this feedback is telling you. The kids that are racing ahead, you give them different kinds of opportunities than you give the kids who may need more of these concepts. Right? Here's how I explain this to people. Um, that's my daughter, uh, Catherine. She is a swimmer. This, uh, so you actually can find this picture on Village Soup, as you can see from the citation. Um, so I'm a, I'm a swim dad. We've probably got some swim parents in here, right? So all of you have endured the, uh, the uh, tedium that is a Saturday swim meet. Um, and I actually like the, I actually like the swim meet where the little, the little kids jump in, and they expend a tremendous, prodigious amount of energy, just arms, legs kicking, and arms flailing, water going everywhere, and no progress. Just they're sitting absolutely still. And I tell people, that's like being in Augusta. It's just energy being to no forward progress. Um, but I, as I was sitting at one of these swimmings, I thought about how this talks about this proficiency-based kind of a system. Because those of you who are swim moms and dads, and swimmers yourselves, who have competed, know that the, when the kids compete, they are put into age brackets, okay, the eight numbers tens to twelves, or whatever, the eights to twelves. They're put in these broad age ranges. But at the swim meet, they are put into the heats they are put in, not based on their physical age. They are based on how fast they swim. And so what's remarkable is you'll sit there and you'll watch a heat come up. And they're organized by speed. Okay, So the slowest swimmers for the hundred butterfly go first. And then you go, each heat is progressively faster and the kids are organized by their, their best time. And what floors you about it is when you look at who gets up on the starting blocks, they're not all little kids. They're not all boys or all girls. They are a mix of kids. There's big kids, there's little kids. My daughter's tiny, but she is unbelievably fast. My, my wife and I have no idea where this came from. <laughs> um, and so she's up on the blocks and she's just this little thing, and next to her might be someone who's tall. And then there's a boy down here who's a little taller still, and then there's a boy who's shorter, and then there's a girl on the other side who's bigger, who's got big shoulders, and then there's a kid who's a little skinny kid. And they're all lined up, not based on physical age, not based on their street address, not based on who their parents were, but based on how fast can they get those little bodies from one end of the pool to the other. And that's the organizing principle there. That's how they're organized to compete. And so the idea behind this model is you're organizing students for instruction based on what they are capable of doing. And that way you don't have some kids in it. Because right now you have the sort of teacher in front of the room. I did this. You get your 20, 25 kids, and you sort of aim for the middle. And you've got some kids that are well ahead. You've got some kids that are a little behind. And you try to aim for the middle, and you try to come up with some extra things for this group of kids to do, and you try to get some extra help for the kids that need the extra help, and you have to sort of aim this broad spray across this classroom. And what we're seeing in districts in Maine that are doing this kind of a model, sort of that's based on this, is trying to figure out how to customize 
How do you regroup kids for instruction all the time? How do you group them for math in one way and then group them in another way for language arts? And how do you how do you structure that so you can try to the degree that you can? We're not going to build a customized education experience for every single child right to the minute. But to the degree that you can customize the system to meet those kids. Customization is a great thing. How many of you know what Pandora is? This is one of those things that I didn't know existed six months ago, and now I can't live without. This, if this isn't the greatest invention of modern times, I don't know what it is. This thing absolutely knocks me out. In fact, it gave me, my wife liked it enough that it gave me an excuse to go out and buy another piece of stereo equipment. So I, I was afraid of that. Pandora is this internet, for those of you who don't know, is this internet-based music service. Okay? But it's not like iTunes, where you go in and you buy a song and then maybe recommend some of the songs for you. What you do is you go in and you tell Pandora what music you like. You pick an artist, for instance, and it'll just start playing. And it'll not only will it play the artist that you like, it goes into its vast database, and it finds other artists and other songs that it thinks you will like based on what you told it you will like. And so all of a sudden, you'll hear another song. You're like, huh, well, who's that? And you go, a little screen will say, here's this other artist. I've never heard of that. And so you go, oh, that's great. And it will continue to do that. And it will sort of adjust. And it will, and, and the best part of it is this. Unlike radio radio, which is, for the, for the most part, acceptable to listen to, um, when it pops up a song that you don't like, you tell it, I don't like it. <laughs> and it stops playing it instantly. And it doesn't play it again. I mean, this thing is a stroke of genius. And so it is constantly adapting to you as you tell it. I like this, I like this artist, I like this song. It goes, all right, if you like that, wait till you hear this. And the thing is constantly doing this. And now the Pandora account that my wife and I have knows us well enough that we just turn it on and it goes. We don't even bother to tell it anymore what we like and don't like. Periodically, it'll spit something out. People just go, well, somebody programmed something like this. Why are we? And you tell it you don't like it. And then it just, it is adapted. It has created a customized internet-based radio station for my house. It's ingenious. So if we can do this, this is the old, if we can put a man on the moon, why can't we get up? I mean, if we can build a customized system that adapts to what you need as you go, that provides you with something that connects to you, and can adapt to what, you're, what you need and what you want and what works for you, this is the kind of approach we want to try and take with education. And I actually picked up this. I was listening to, um, a, I have a podcast uh, on my iPod that was related to this. Uh, it's a Freakonomics podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with Freakonomics, the book that came out as a podcast. And they got talking about this. And they, they talked about this in the context of education. And they talked about, in New York City, this, this uh, school called the School of One. And the School of One is this proficiency-based model we're talking about. And it works the same way, which is that they have lots of ed different educational approaches for students. And the question for students in this question that they use, the question that you see inside the building is choose your modality. What's the best way for you to learn this stuff? And so when you go into School of One, you can choose large group instruction, you have small group instruction, they have online courses, they have online tutors that they can use, they have self-directed you know, computer classes or computer programs where kids sit down and the computer adapts to them. Uh, they have distance learning opportunities, they have mixed pairs, they have one-on-one. -on -one. They've tried to figure out ways to provide whatever that resource is. And what we're seeing is that same kind of thing happening here in Maine. This is Shelley Moody, that's me peeking over in the back, this is when I visited the school year last year. This is Shelley Moody, who's our 2001 Teacher of the Year. And when you go into Shelley Moody's classroom up in Oakland, she is working on this very model. And so she doesn't stand at the front and trying to reach all of these kids all at the same time. And a lot of, most teachers don't in that same model that we sort of understand now. Instead, of what when you go around and talk to these kids, which is what I'm doing in the background of this picture, is you go to the kids, you say, what are you working on? And they will say, here's the learning outcome. These are fourth graders, by the way. Here's the learning outcome that I'm working on. Okay, here's the standard. Here's the learning outcome, the learning uh, objective that I'm trying to meet. This is the educational piece that I'm doing to try to meet it. Set up, and this is how I'm going to demonstrate my learning. And, it's, and you could go to any one of the kids in that class and ask them in fourth grade, and they'll tell you the same thing. And so, what that frees Shelley and the other teachers to do is go around and help kids individually and help them move their projects along. 
And these kids are all working independently. And they're all working at their own pace, using a modality that works for them. And they do the assessment when they feel they're ready to do the assessment. So you don't take the spelling test on Thursday when everybody takes the spelling test. You take the spelling test when you feel you're ready to take the spelling test and to demonstrate that you mastered those standards. And so it's a flexible system where the goal is to master those standards and then to demonstrate the mastery of those standards. And if it takes you extra time to do that, that's okay. So that's kind of the system. And I've, in other schools that I visited, when I went down to uh, the southern part of the state, I went to another school, it was a middle school. Uh, and usually you go to these schools and when I visited these schools, you come in and they have a student council. They greet you at the door and the student council kids are there and they take you on the tour. And they show you the things that kids want to show you. They show you the cafeteria, and here's the gym, and you're like, okay, it looks great, nice cafeteria. Um, but not at this school. This was, uh, I want to say this was Massachusetts Middle School. And instead, when I went there, they said, well, we've got a couple of students who want to talk to you, make sure you sort of understand how we do things around. Okay? So we went into one of these little conference rooms right next to the office, and there were two seventh graders, seventh graders, probably speaking, because they were really great at this middle school. And they sat down, and they had their binders. And they said, you know, we're going to explain to you how, how this works. And they opened their binders, and they showed for each of their courses where they were in their learning standards. And these are the standards that they achieved, and here were the benchmarks, and here's the, their portfolio that showed where they had demonstrated their mastery of the standards, and here's the standard they were on at that point, and how they were going to do that, and who they were working with, and they were grouped with this student to do this one, and they were grouped with this other student to do this other one. And they were sort of motoring through this, and every once in a while they break. So every once in a while they say, do you have any questions? So are we going too fast? Are you going too fast? Uh, and it was great. And sure enough, when we went back to the classroom, you saw a classroom, this was seventh grade, you saw a classroom very much like this. Which is to say that the kids were working on all kinds of stuff. And you could go to any one of those kids, and these two kids were working on a science piece, and here's their science standard. And these two kids were in the hall working on a math piece, because these were the math standards they were working on. And the teacher would pop in and out, and they had set up a system where if you, who, you know, when you have a question, come see me. And, and they had set up this whole system where they were working independently. And they were working at different times of the day, and they would come by and work on something later in the day, and then they'd come back later and work on it some more. And it was just this very fluid system. And what floored me about it probably most of all is the level of ownership that kids had over their own learning. When I was a kid, my view of school is that school was something that was being done to me. It wasn't something that I had that I was invested in. I didn't want to go to school. Why would you want to go to school? Uh, so school was something that I that was had to be endured from my uh, estimation. But when you went into these schools, kids would say, "This, these are my learning outcomes. This is the way I've chosen to to pick up this knowledge. I'm using an online piece, or I'm doing this. These these three other um, friends of mine were all working together on this project, where we're doing research and we're using our laptops <coughs> and doing this and the other. But it was their notebooks and their binders and their organizers and their uh, learning outcomes that they were mastering and their portfolio that showed all of their learning. And they were very proud of them. And it just was a very, very interesting uh, sort of model. And what we're seeing is that school districts, and this is a little hard to see because the colors are not bright enough, but what we've got now is school districts across Maine doing this very same thing. And what you see in here is the red districts. And again, this is a little hard to see. I know it's a little, it's a little uh, bleached out, but the red districts are districts that are either they're in some degree of implementing some type of an approach like this. And they're all in varying different places around that. Some of them are just, and we don't have every, this isn't fully updated, so we've got districts that are doing some of this on this map. Some of them are, are just looking at how they're organizing instruction differently. They're using uh, multi, you know, they've got multiple kids in class. For instance, if you go back to Shelley's class now, one of the, when she first started doing this a couple of years ago, she was doing this within her class. In other words, she was trying to figure out how to do this in her class. She now has, she, there's, I want to say, four fourth grades. And now the four fourth grade teachers are all working together, and kids are being moved around all the time. They're over here for math, they're with these group of kids for somebody else, with this teacher, they're doing this with this teacher. Uh, my youngest daughter, Catherine, who you saw swimming, uh, did the multi age program over here in Rockwood. Uh, it was the same thing with two multi age programs. Their kids are moving around all the time. They're being grouped and regrouped based on what their learning needs were, uh, because we're using assessment to tell us that. So we have districts doing this. And it's important, um, while I'm up here, to point out that this is not something that we have imposed from the main department of education. We wouldn't have the capacity to, to do it anyway, to force it on anybody if we wanted to. Uh, this is really districts uh, deciding on their own. School boards, superintendents, teachers, 
deciding on their own that this is something that they want to try and see how it works and try some different aspects of it. Uh, and you see it's across Maine all over the place, and the numbers are continuing to grow. Not because of anything that I've done, I'm sorry to say, because I'd love to be able to take credit for some of this, uh, but really because districts have started to explore this, and all these districts are confronting the same challenge, which is the challenge that we saw all the way back here with these test scores. We're not, we can't, it doesn't seem as though, no matter what we do, we can move these numbers in any kind of sustainable, seismic way. And I think districts are starting to go, you know what, there's got to be some other way to do this, where we can reach each one of these kids and bring them along uh, to meet these standards. So you have school districts, again, not with any direction from the department. Now, we're helping them out, we've got curriculum people who work with them, uh, and who help facilitate, we try and get resources, we're building some web pieces. We can get into this a little bit later about how the department is supporting these work, this work as we support work in all the districts. Uh, but this really is a grassroots, district-led initiative uh, where districts have looked at themselves in the mirror and said, you know, we're going to have to try something else here because no matter how hard we're working on this, it just isn't working for our kids. Uh, and we're seeing this around the world as well. There's tons of talk recently about Finland. Okay. Finland has become the, uh, the great uh, the, the school system, global school system that has seen all of these kind of great results. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work recently about what are they doing in Finland that's making it work so well. And Finland's doing a lot of things. Uh, uh, the, probably the bulk piece of what the main piece of what they're doing is a lot of focus on teacher training and support. Uh, Finland has eight, eight teacher uh, higher education training facilities. In other words, universities that do teacher training is only eight in the entire country. Uh, and they're very focused and they're very tough to get into. Uh, only one out of every ten applicants to a teacher prep, a university teacher prep program in Finland gets into the program in the front end. It's very, very tough. Uh, so they've done a tremendous amount of work about teaching curriculum. But one of the other pieces they're moving to, and I talked at this conference that I told you about that I was at in San Francisco, uh, it was that there were folks from all over the globe here that were talking about just these things. And there was a group from China, and there was a group from Singapore, there was a group from Finland, and there was another group from Germany, and there was a group from Brazil. Uh, there were two or three states from the United States. Uh, that, um, our main is part of the network of, of states that are doing this kind of work. Uh, they talked a little bit about their, their move towards this personalized learning. Today, and this is in this book, Finish Lessons, just came out, I want to say it came out last year, um, uh, by a guy who's it's been running the system over there. It's, it's an, actually, it's a pretty good, it's a short read, it's a pretty good one. Um, somebody just handed it to me at a, at a meeting I was at, and I read it on the plane, and it's, it's pretty good. Uh, but they talk in here about today's students build their own personalized learning schedules from a menu of courses offered in their school or by other education institutions. So they're given these lots of choices, lots of opportunities to choose choose their pathway, and they are given those opportunities. Studying is, uh, is therefore more flexible. Selected courses can be completed at different pace depending on students' abilities and life situations. Structure also has abolished classes, or as they abolish classes, uh, in which the same group of students move from one lesson to another and from one grade to the next. So Finland, which is looked at as this model, and these other countries that we're looking at as models, have also realized that we're going to have to move to some different kind of approach here. And they are looking at this kind of personalized model where you present kids with a model of instruction, lots of different ways to get that access. And this is this hasn't always been easy to do. It certainly is tougher in small schools where you don't you don't have four fourth grades that you can move kids around. And you've got a uh, small like my Penobscot Elementary School, which have very small classes. Uh, but even as we'll hear from the panelists up here, even in schools where we don't have a lot of uh, you know, we don't have big classes, we can't move kids around as much. There are ways to, to do that. It almost goes we've almost come full circle to some degree back to those uh, those one-room schoolhouse days where you had kids of all different age levels and you were sort of building an educational experience for each of them based on where they were. Uh, so we're seeing um, all kinds of nations doing this. And this has been a piece uh, that our role in this has been to sort of pull this into our uh, strategic plan. <coughs> so if you go to the department's website, uh, last year what we did was this listening tour. We went around to a number of different schools. We talked to superintendents, we talked to school boards, we talked to kids. Uh, we got some feedback on what do you want the department to be doing, what should be our focus, what do we need to stop doing, what do we need to start doing, how can we help you? And we organized sort of our thinking. This is a lot of stuff, this is a lot of stuff. Education is covers a lot of ground. So we needed to try and how we even organize our thinking about this. And so we came up with this graphic um, that puts the student here at the center. Okay, not technically sort of on the side, but in the center, you get there. So the student is here, and you build sort of out from there. 
And we start with what is the, the, the ex educational experience that's closest to that learning? And that's this effective learner-centered instruction. So this is your standards of curricula. This is your instructional practice that you use using these uh, instructional practices that are very uh, student-driven uh, assessment systems. You've got to have those assessments. We give you that data so you know how to group those kids. How do you group kids? We have a constant stream of assessment data that you're analyzing to figure out how to group kids effectively for their instruction. And information systems. I think this is one of the challenges when we have the practitioners up here who've been doing this work in, on the ground in schools. They will tell you that we're, we're really wrestling with this data system piece. How do we track mastery of those standards over time? It's a big piece we need to continue to work on. None of this matters. And even if you have all this stuff, it doesn't work unless you have these great teachers and leaders out here. That's that second frame. So that's your teacher training, your standards for teacher leader effectiveness, your preparation programs, uh, your professional development programs. It's all the training programs, next generation evaluation systems, communities of practice to allow teachers to share resources. We are going to be building an online community of practice website. We've actually got it piloted. We're tinkering around with it to see if we can get it to do what we want it to do. That we've built in house, and it will allow teachers from and administrators, everybody else from all over the state, to swap ideas with each other, to post things. Here are the rubrics we use. Here are the assessment we use. Here's what we did with this student. Here's what we did uh, with this particular learning result. All of this kind of data can be put up, so it can be shared by the districts. It's sorted. It's tagged. Uh, so we're taking advantage of all this modern technology that, that helps us find things on the web and index that. So that's the way we're going to be able to share all of this. We're talking to the educator preparation programs about how do we expand professional development. Uh, we are proposing in the budget that we free up some money to try and support some regional initiatives, to build some regional teacher training centers. If you are able to build, uh, with the help of many flags, a common school calendar for this area, I mean, imagine what that will free up for you in terms of being able to do common professional development across all the districts. And I know when I was in the middle school Canada, we did some of that, but it was tough to do. I mean, I remember doing stuff with Belfast Air Sport, um, but it was hard to do. I mean, but we did get days, you know, common days, and allowed you to do all that professional development work. So we're doing some pieces there. Multiple pathways. This is kind of the piece that's the core of what we've been talking about. Advancement based on demonstration of mastery. Uh, we're going to move kids along and they demonstrate uh, the learning results. Student voice and choice in that demonstration of learning. Giving kids some sense, what's the best way that you learn this? What's the best way to tackle this? What's the best way for you to demonstrate to me that you that, that you learned this information? And when you cut kids loose and let them design their own stuff and figure out ways to demonstrate their learning, uh, it's great. And they'll come in as a, as a former eighth grade social studies teacher. I don't have these open-ended things. You show me, show me how you that you know this stuff. I don't care how you do it, show me how. I have kids bring in models and posters. A lot of teachers do this nowadays. This is exactly uh, earth-shattering uh, new idea. Um, but really opening that up so kids have a, a big, a lot of voice, a lot of choices on how they're directing their learning. Expanded learning options, anytime, anywhere learning. You know, this is access to technology. This is online learning. Online learning is exploding. These courses are everywhere. And it's not even a whole course. It might be something like a Khan Academy. It's just a video. You know? uh, these things are exploding. They're all over. One of the things we're wrestling with now is how do we index, how do we make sure the quality is there. Uh, that's a piece of work we need to do. School and community support. This is making sure that we've got our health and wellness programs. We've got the right services that our special, our special uh, needs learners are going to have. This is all that community, family engagement piece. How do we get families and communities engaged into the process and get them? Because we know if we're going to move to anytime, anywhere learning, that means kids may be learning in opportunities when they're outside of school. Uh, I was back in Washington this week, and I was re remembering while I was down there that I, when I was in high school, George Seeks Academy in Blue Hill, I did a three-week internship in Center Mitchell's office down in Washington. Uh, now, I didn't get any credit for that, uh, but that was a learning opportunity. I'm, I'm sure I mastered and met some of Maine's learning results from that experience. So we need to figure out how do we connect those experiences and bring both the, the broader community, families engaged, and career and workforce partnerships. How do we get businesses engaged? How do we get kids really applying their learning, maybe working in a work setting for a couple couple of weeks to get some of those learning uh, outcomes there. And then this is kind of state level stuff. This is integration of programs longitudinally. How do we make sure the high school lines up to the community college system, university system? How do we align those programs? The resources, obviously, a huge issue. Uh, integration of technology, both data systems, reporting, all of that kind of stuff, and accountability and improvement. Part of the discussion that we had with Secretary Duncan uh, and myself and the, the, the commissioner from New Hampshire, the commissioner from Vermont, managed to get 10 minutes with him, which is hard to get. Uh, to say, you know, we're really interested in moving this model. We have the opportunity under the No Child Behind waiver, which Secretary Duncan has put forward to the states, to maybe build a new accountability system that replaces No Child Behind. 
with something that's more structured like this, where we're going to look at how much growth did that, not, not how did this year's seventh graders do compared to last year's seventh graders. That's how we determine how good a school is. We compare how your test scores this year were compared to your test scores last year. Did you make adequate yearly progress, measuring an entirely different group of kids? We want to build a system where we're tracking learning outcomes over time, where the outcome is the variable, and the outcome is fixed, and time is the variable, not the other way around. That's the system we have now. Time is fixed, and the outcome is variable. We want to flip that. And so we talked to Secretary Duncan. He's a big fan of the School of One Mile. He's very interested in it. So we're going to have to get back to work and, and think about how we might do that. New Hampshire's actually been doing quite a lot of work around it. So this is kind of how all of this has fit into our thinking. We do have a piece of legislation out there, LD 1422, uh, is being considered by the legislature. Um, and what this would do is move us to a standards-based diploma over time. Uh, and so it would allow us to get a, a, a diploma that was really based on those master standards. It does not, I want to point out, especially to our, our friends and parents and everybody from RSU2 specifically, this is a shout out to you, it does not mandate that any school district do any of this. It does say that we want to get to a proficiency-based diploma, which we've been trying to get to for 20 years, ever since we put learning results into place. Uh, when we put learning results into place, the goal was that we were going to have a diploma. You were going to get a diploma until you, sh you showed everybody that you met those standards. So that's what this bill would do. It does create some additional flexibility. It does allow districts to say, you know, here's a, here's a piece of state law or policy that's getting in the way of being able to do this. And it has a waiver component that allows them to come and say, here's our plan. We want, you know, this is a thing that says it has to be done by this age. Can we get away with that? So it brings some flexibility to But it does not, it does not impose on districts from Augusta this type of a system. How you deploy this, how you use it, whether you even do it at all, is entirely a local school decision, a local school board decision. Uh, we have standards, we have learning results. That's at the state level. We have the diploma requirements. That's the state level. So a diploma for every high school in the state means the same thing. And right now it doesn't. President Fitzsimmons, I'll tell you what President Fitzsimmons, who is president of community college system, told me. He said, when we get a community, when we get applications from kids with the community college system, the first thing we look at on that application is, any guess? Name of the high school. And he said, that tells us whether that transcript and that diploma means anything or not. That's what we look at. So we have diploma standards because we want to say, a kid that gets a high school diploma in this state has met this system of learning results that we established, by the way, in 1997. So that's what this bill would do, it's work its way through the legislature. We think it's a way to sort of get us on this path. Um, but this is a very exciting time. And again, this isn't coming from us. This is coming from district school leaders across the state who've decided, you know what, let's try something different that's going to meet the needs of all kids. Let's build systems that meet the needs of all kids. So it's a very exciting time. It's, it's exciting to go into these schools and see what the districts are doing. And I'm looking forward to the panel where we're actually be able to talk to people who are actually doing this and not politicians in Augusta who are trying to take credit for it. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.